Welcome to Conversations with African Writers, recorded at the University of Pretoria's Future Africa Institute. I am Professor Chawana Kupe, the Vice Chancellor and Principal at UP. As UP, Future Africa and the Humanities, we are committed to supporting African literature through our syllabus and through less formal channels as the Africa Book and Design Festival, and this streamed biannual Conversations with African Writers Program. Dr. Sipio Mahala, Sukisa Wena, Yara Nakahanda Monteiro have written historical narratives that look frankly into the human conditions across space and time. And I can tell you they're most, some of the most amazing writers in the world. In Mahala's biography, Ken Temba, The Making and Breaking of the Intellectual Zozi, Temba's critical role in recordings of Africa's urbanization anti apathic struggle and as renaissance is poetically written. We read about Temba, the writer, the editor, the lover of parties, and the mentor. We are transported into the fabulous 1950s and are part of a historical moment like the defiance campaign and the Sophia town removers. This important biography excavates recent history in an accessible and dynamic way. Although an academic study, Mahala manages to balance academic rigor and narrative flair to produce a book that is interesting and informative. Temba's charisma, his prowess as a short story writer and an editor are qualities that are celebrated. Temba's exile in Swaziland is a rare slice of history, the hidden history of South African exiles that is yet to be fully told. Zukisa Oena's fictional account of the life and times of Nolsen Rolisha Mandela, titled The Plain Pimpnel, Mandela on the Run, is targeted at the young adult market and expertly fuses fact and fiction in relating the highs and lows of Mandela's life as an underground operative. The account shows Madiva as a hero with feet of clay, powerful yet accessible a read that must surely be on the bookshelves all over the world. Loose Ties by Yara Montiero tells the story of Vittorio, who goes back to Angola to try and piece, piece together the mother's story, who was a revolutionary in the Angolan Civil War. She's guided by Zacharias Vindu, an arms trafficking general, and widow Romana Cambisa. A lot is revealed when she finally meets her mother's best friend, Juliana Tichamba, who, like Victoria's mother, fought in the Civil War. The writers in this episode will be in conversation with future Africa fellow, the incomparable Dr. Nokutula Mazibukom Simang, about their books, process, and the future and imperative of historical narratives. Historical narratives are indeed a way to reflect on Africa's history as we continue to think through and have conversations about implementing solutions to complex colonial paths. Be part of the conversation and support African literature. Thank you. Hello to Zuki Swavana, or Zooks as she is known to most of us, a very warm UP and future Africa welcome uh, to this episode of Conversations with African Writers. And thank you so much, Zuki Savena, for talking to us. And uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you very so, much for having me on UP. <laughs> it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. So I'm going to read your, your, your fabulous uh, profile first. So uh, Zugi Savena, who I'm sure is no stranger to a lot of people watching, is the award-winning author of four novels, three can children's they books, Google two non-fiction books. No, they can't Google it. They must hear it in this episode. <laughs> Her last children's book was Africa, a true book. In 2020, she became the first African woman to be a Guta medalist. I'm so, so proud of this. In the same year, she founded the virtual literary festival Afrolit Sans Frontiers and was selected among New Africa's 100 most influential 
Africans. So ladies and gentlemen, I am now going to ask uh, Zuki Swavena to tell us about the book that we'll be discussing today. And Zooks, oh, you're going to read you. I'm so glad that it's virtual, so you can't, you know, throw a shoe at me or something. But I, you know, I, I misplaced the copy that you gave me. So I've, I've now been reading it on my mobile. It looks a little bit shiny, but you can see it, right? So I have been reading The Black Pimpanel, Nelson Mandela on the Run as an e-book which I know you prefer real hard copy books, uh, but I have really um, enjoyed rereading it. Uh, and of course, you are going to tell us about the Black Pimpanel, Nelson Mandela on the Run, what it's about, and then go into a reading uh, for us, please. Over to you, Zooks. Right. This is what the book looks like. <laughs> The fabulous green cover. It looks anyway, gorgeous. <laughs> so um, the book uh, really is for YAs, but can be read by people who are children at heart and older people. And suddenly, I think actually older people can read it because when I read, when I wrote it, when I was doing the research, I I, I discovered a lot of things that I didn't know about. Uh, the person that the, the world knows as Nelson Mandela. And um, I was writing particularly of a phase that I liked in his history, which is uh, during the time that he was undercover as the Black Pimpernel. So after he was arrested, after he was, um, the charges were dropped uh, for uh, the treason trial and before he got arrested for the Rivonia trial. So that's mm -hmm. that, that little phase. And uh, so what led him to being undercover and how he ended up being, being discovered. Uh, and of course, I took some creative liberty, as one does, because I was not there in the 60s. Maybe I wasn't even there in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. But anyway, <laughs> as a young person, yeah. this is, I shall give an excerpt. And the excerpt I'm giving is where... Nelson Mandela goes to um, goes for a meeting at the Slovos in, in Park Town, for those who are familiar with Johannesburg. And there's a policeman, a plainclothes policeman who follows him. And then later on, uh, he has to report that he can't find this guy. And uh, yeah, so that's essentially it, because Nelson has left. Um, What are you all looking at? You heard the man. Find Mandela. Everyone continued to look around quietly as though trying to decide what to do. What are you waiting for? Now! He yells again, just like uncle on the phone. There's a flurry of activity in the office. But maybe this is not the way to do it, he thinks. He needs a better strategy. All right, everyone, gather around, please. The policemen come over to Foster's desk, hesitantly. They're not used to this level of politeness. Among them is the policeman who has been on Monday duty. Constable could see her. So what happened? How did you lose him? And the young policeman explains to everyone. He followed Mandela to join Ruth's house yesterday at late afternoon. He was not wearing a uniform and was in an unmarked car. He watched the gates the whole night. Uh, except, he says with some hesitation, <laughs> except when? Sergeant Forster wants to know. The other three policemen not to encourage him to go on. Well, there was a time when that Ruth came over. He sounds hesitant. And last night, it was 22.43 hours. I just looked at my wristwatch. She knocked on my car window like so. He imitates her knocking, using Foster's desk. Go on. She was holding a flask of coffee and cake, and she said, Officer, it's getting chilly out here. I brought you some coffee and cake while you wait. There's a collective groan from the other policemen. Ah. <laughs> what? I don't know how she knew. I was in an unmarked car, and I wasn't wearing uniform. But when she showed, she thought I may be working for the police. I thought it was a kind gesture. Liberals are generally not kind to us. They hate us. Foster puts his right hand in a fist, then punches into his left hand. He wishes he could punch 
this policeman. What is wrong with you? Is there something wrong with your mind? Is there uh, something wrong with you? He asked while poking the policeman's head. No, sir. I just thought, you are not paid to think, man. <laughs> or to eat cake and coffee from communists. Are you also a communist now? Post our questions. No, sir. It's just that it was so cold and it was so kind. The policeman says miserable. You could have been poisoned. How did you find out that Mandela was gone? Foster wants to know. This morning, a Slovos maid came and knocked on my window. She had come to get the plate and coffee flask and come from, my, from the car. And she said to me, Mr. Joe told me to tell you that you can leave now. Mr. Mandela left last night. <laughs> the buffoonery, right, of the apartheid state machinery. I love that, but I'm so glad you read it. It was actually one of my favorite parts. And what I love, Zuki Savannah, about what you do with the Nelson Mandela story, which is a well-known story, right? I mean, you know, South Africa's first democratic president. We know the story of Mandela. But um, those moments where you use humor, you know, as just anxiety relief, you know, um, and especially for, for kind of older readers like myself who lived through apartheid, who find struggle narratives triggering, you know? Um, so, and you call it, of course, you call it creative nonfiction. So that's where I'd like to start. Can you just explain that about this fantastic book of yours, creative nonfiction? You know, what is that? And, you know, which parts are creative, which parts are nonfiction? And I mean, just how did you write it? Talk to us. Okay, so it's... Uh, non-fiction in the fact that, of course, it was rooted in Nelson Mandela's actual story. Uh, but the creative part of it, which is, you know, where I embellish. Uh, so I had access, the, 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 the Nelson Mandela Foundation gave me access to the, to the archives. So I was able then to, um, you know, read his diary during the time that he was traveling. And I oh, also wow. obviously had like other books uh, to make reference to, you know, Fatima Mea, his own, mm -hmm. and just other different struggle credentials, um, uh, struggle narratives to, 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 you know, to kind of center and figure out. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you read, uh, what you call it, um, I think Long Walk to Freedom, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was also useful. Of course, in Long Walk to Freedom, for instance, he does refer to um, the head of uh, state in, uh, in, in Sierra Leone, where he went to visit as prime president when he was actually a prime minister. So there were those things, but I was also enjoying uh, looking at it and, 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 and reading it from a perspective of being in, 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 in lockdown, because I wrote it in 2020, yeah. and it came out last year. And uh, so the, the history is very much true to book. What I did, though, is because I wanted to give a little personality to Uz and Annie and Zinzi. And they were much younger when, when he went into prison. So I made them slightly older than they would have been so that, you know, uh, they, could, uh, they could interact with this right. father at least yeah. and we could see his humane side. Uh, obviously, the dialogue uh, would have been fictionalized, you know, although a lot of the players were there. And one of my favorite places myself is where allegedly uh, uh, Walter bakes scones, and that oh, changes yeah. that changes how Moses Kotane decides to look at whether the the yeah. African National Congress should go into an armed struggle or not, all based yeah. on like eating scones. <laughs> no, I love. I wonder about that part. Uncle Walter, was he a baker then, or is it just something that you made up? Well, I mean, he was raised by his mom. I would imagine he probably knew how to cook and stuff. <laughs> I wonder. I wondered about that bit. I was like, hmm, you know, because baking is quite difficult to do, you know. Um, but I must say, I did love those those touches because, as you say, that it is anchor. I mean, it's fiction, it's fiction right? I mean, you write about the, the treason trial, them getting acquitted and don't do it. But also you've done this creative thing where it comes full circle. So it starts at the moment of their capture, uh, yeah. where he is traveling with Cecil Williams and, you know, uh, and also ends at the moment 
of their capture, of their you capture. know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for me, I was wondering, you know, as you are um, uh, uh, sifting through the material, you know, uh, because this is targeted at younger readers, but somebody like myself read the book and thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, um, but were then part of the history, because this is about starting Umkonto with Sizwe, right, which is the military wing of the African National Con Congress. So this is not Nelson Mandela, the grandfather that we knew who came out in 1990, smiling with gray hair. This is Nelson Mandela, the Umkonto with Sizwe soldier, right? So in, 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 in choosing what to put into uh, the book, you know, were there other parts where you felt, ah, maybe with the acts of sabotage that I will pick this, you know, I was interested that you did uh, record the Monife incident and put it in. You know, but how did you choose what to put in and what to leave out? Well, I wanted I wanted the type of um, well, firstly to start with, it was pretty easy because I was looking at just a space of, I think it must have been like eighteen months. That's that's when that's when the he was the black pimpernel. That's when he was undercover. It was that little space of time. It was less than two years. So mm -hmm. yeah, so 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 the time frame was pretty easy. And what was equally easy was obviously, um, you know, so, okay, this organization is formed, we're having it, we're making it happen. But mm -hmm. then, um, how, do we, how do we train each other to, um, to, to handle weapons when we've got, like, the police watching us and we're banned people? And so that was important for me to, to deal with as well, you know, and... and uh, and dealing with the fact that initially Mandela had been a politician, but then he, he transforms. And I wanted to highlight that transformation. Yeah. It transforms from being a politician to being a soldier by being the moment that he saw that he's the commander in chief of uh, the mm -hmm. MK. The other thing, you know, I, I had to verify certain things with um, the late Auntie Lindwe Mabuza, for instance, because I know she used to work for Radio Freedom. And, uh, you know, and there are also other people that I verified certain things with just to get it right. Like, when did this happen exactly? Uh, there were books, you know, uh, that I looked at. Uh, there's a book where, which talks of, you know, the capture of, um, of um, Chris Honey and a, and, a, and, a, and a bunch of other soldiers. And, um, you know, well, a bunch of other young MK recruits at that time. And they were captured... They was they were, they were stopped into coming into 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 the then northern Rhodesia, which was about to become Zambia, uh, by the British police who were about to deport them back to South Africa because they apparently say to them that they were too too light to be Ooh. to be northern Rhodesia in the in the same way that perhaps we say our relatives mm. are too dark to be South African. I don't know what that means, but anyway, <laughs> so um, they. But what then happened is it was during the Lancaster, the Lancaster House Conference was ongoing at that time. And uh, uh, Simon Kapwepwe, who was uh, uh, Kenneth Kaunda's first deputy, and Kenneth Kaunda himself said they would withdraw from the negotiations if these men were not set free in, uh, in, um, in, in, in Northern Rhodesia, you know. They weren't going to be deported to apartheid South Africa. And I think, you know, sometimes when... You know, while I was reading that, I was thinking to myself, you know, we, we so often sometimes forget um, how we owe our freedom to some of our neighbors, you know, so yeah. Yeah, but also how we have a, um, a common history, you know. Um, I mean, I think myself, uh, like you, Zoops, I mean, every inch of the continent uh, is my home, you know. Um, and I think also what happens when you read your, your book with uh, Matiba uh, receiving military uh, training in Ethiopia and, you know, in the West and uh, various other parts, you know, um, you really, really Please, get a can sense. Can you verify that when you say the West, you mean West Africa, not, not West, like... It's global, obvious. Global it's it's, it's yeah, obvious. I just, I just need it's you obvious. to verify that for this it's obvious. recording, I mean, Jay. In, in West Africa. So you went for, for military training in West Africa. And, um, you know, how I think that the, the, in, in how you narrate 
all of that history, you know, um, it's really um, very familiar, you know, and how he, Madiba himself, uh, saw the common destiny. Uh, there's a part in, in, in the book where he says, you know, um, uh, you know, walking in Tanzania, walking in Ethiopia, you know, um, unhindered by any constraints, you know, I want to bring that same sense of freedom to Bechuana land. Of course, Botswana was called Bechuana land at, at the time, and it was yet to be liberated, you know? So, I mean, you know, for, for me, it, because I don't really like talking about that history, as you know, I have given it, you know, to the children and I plan to gift it to many more children, you know? And, and I was wondering, I mean, <sighs> What was your purpose, you know, for, for writing the book? I mean, why did you write the book? Well, I wanted children, you know, I wanted younger people to really uh, have something that would, that they'd be able to be entertained by, but also give a lesson in history, the history of this man that uh, they hear, Utatom Kuluab or whatever, you know, in history, uh, this this figure. And I wanted, and I was happy, obviously, as I mentioned, that it was this particular part in history that we're doing. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to have the reality of, of uh, what some of the things that might have been uh, regarding apartheid. So, for instance, um, you know, when I mentioned the guy, of course, it was largely believed that it was... Uh, Bruno Mtolo, who is the one who, you know, betrayed whatever. But I also wanted to show yeah. that it was never quite black and white, you know. Yeah. You had, um, you know, what what would you do if you were taken and then you are tortured and you have to betray your comrades? So it's not like, oh, you're just a sellout, full stop. Or yeah. if you're a police, you're just a bad guy, full stop, because there were also police, uh, black policemen who would then like yeah. warn these guys that there's a raid about to happen and stuff. So yeah. I wanted, I wanted to show, you know, the, um, um, you know, black South Africa during that mm -hmm. part of apartheid in its, you know, in its, in, in 3D, if you will. And uh, Zooks, you know, I really want to commend you for um, that 3D approach, you know, uh, because it is so nuanced and it is so beautiful, you know, um, how, you know, you wrote the, the characters, how you wrote the situations, even Umar, you know, like you say, with some of the so-called collaborators were actually playing a very useful role, you know, um, in the struggle. And one thing that I wondered about, I mean, uh, you said you were interested in, in Nelson Mandela's underground journey, right? Uh, but I also know that it was part of a series, a global series or, on important iconic figures, you know? Um, yes. And was there a discussion between you and the publisher about which part of the history to cover or was it just 100% Zuki Swabana interested in the Black Pimpernel? No, we actually, uh, we, we, the, um, the historical figures we're looking at, it was all during like a certain period of history. Uh, so, okay. yeah. so that okay. was that was that was that was very deliberate. Or oh, and the other reason why I wrote it the way I did, which I think is important to highlight is, you know, it was um as I mentioned, it was at the height of uh COVID. And I thought to myself, if I never write another book again, you know, if I die of COVID, if I never write another book again, I want this to be the sort of book that I live for the kids, you know, to have access to. And, and uh, that will teach them something new about their own history. And so in that way, that's why it was important for me to do the whole 3D thing that I mentioned earlier. Wow, and Zugisa Havana, I mean, I think it's, it's a classic, right? I mean, you know, I love the book and, you know, congratulations to you, congratulations to your publisher. It is a beautifully written, uh, sensitively written, um, piece of history. So congratulations and thank you, Zuki Savannah. Thank you for having me. First of all, I would like to say uh, welcome uh, to Dr. Uh, Sipiwa Mahala. And I am going to just briefly uh, read his uh, uh, biography so that you know exactly who he is. So Dr. Sipiwa Mahala is a literary critic, novelist, 
short story writer and playwright, plying his trade in both English and Isikosa languages. Born and raised in Grahamstown, now called Makanda, he imbibed the arts from an early age and grew a passion for books. He is the author of the award-winning novel, When a Man Cries, which he translated into his native Iskosa language under the title, Yakali Ndota in 2010. His short story collection, African Delights, was selected by The Guardian in 2016 as one of the top 10 must read books in the world. In 2014, the book was published by Bookcraft Africa for distribution in West Africa. Mahala's latest collection of short stories, Red Apple Dreams and Other Stories was released in October, 2019. He studied literature and creative writing at several universities, including the universities of Fort Hare, Rhodes and the University of the Vet Patrasan Rand. Mahala holds a doctoral degree in English literature from the University of South Africa. And he is a Jaya scholar and is currently the senior lecturer at the University of English at the University of Johannesburg. And today I will be talking to him about his latest book, a book that I'm very excited about titled Ken Temba, The Making and Breaking of the Intellectual Gozi, a Biography. Doc, congratulations. Thank you, great to be here, uh, following the first days of my uncle, um, yes. Uncle Zeksimda. So I, I feel really privileged to be one of the first cohort of, of writers to be featured in the program. Well, we are glad to have you here at Conversations with African Writers. Doc, this book has been a long time coming. Just talk us through your process, you know, how did Ken Temba, the making and breaking of the intellectual to come about? Well, uh, first of all, I've, I've had a relationship with Ken Temba uh, through creative writing, um, mainly being introduced to him through his short story, The Suit, which uh, in 2002, I, I responded to by writing my own imagination, The Suit Continued. And then um, after that, I, I tried to know a bit more about Ken Temba. I started to speaking to people who um, interacted with him during his time and who, who knew him personally, and you know, including the likes of Brawili um, Hosisile, uh, uh, Nadine Godima, um, uh, Don Matera, and many others. And in 2014, I registered for PhD um, uh, with UNISA. Um, pursuing, you know, uh, further research on Ken Temba. And I graduated in, uh, in 2018. And then my uh, doctoral thesis won the NHSS award to convert it into a book. So um, from 2019 or so, I started writing toward, I mean, working towards um, the first biography of Ken Temba, which uh, is finally here five years since his passing. Wow. And, you know, obviously, Doc, I mean, I have spoken to you a lot about this book. And as you know, I love, love, love this book. You know, every bookshelf in Africa needs to have a copy, you know. And what for you is, was the most interesting finding, you know, uh, um, about Ken Temba that's recorded in the book? Well, I, I think the first thing, um, what, what really, you know, um, gave me the nudge to do the research was the fact that Ken Temba, you know, has been celebrated. I mean, his work at least has been featured, uh, whether you're talking the short story tradition in South Africa, whether you're talking uh, the history of journalism, particularly among Black people, Ken Temba is always mentioned prominently. Um, so... I was interested uh, to know, first of all, you know, what, what made Ken Temba such a, a talented um, a, a writer. Um, you know, reading people like Yusula Bennett, for instance, uh, who says um, uh, he was the most exciting and uh, most talented writer of the 50s and early 60s. You know, so, but to my disappointment, there was no definitive study on him, you know, 
Um, all we knew is Kentemba during the drum days. So I, I went, you know, back to his childhood um, university. I think at university in particular, that's one of my first discoveries was that 1953, uh, which is the year in which he won the, short story, the Drum Short Story Award, was not necessarily the first time that he started writing. He had been writing um, throughout his university days, possibly even in high school, but I couldn't find anything from high school. Um, the earliest published work that I could find of Ken Temba dates as far back as 1945, when he was doing his... Um, his, his first year at the University of Forte, uh, he published in a, in a, in a university journal called SANC for South African uh, Native College. And um, quite interestingly, that's the same journal where uh, uh, Dennis Brutas first published, you know. Um, so I discovered that, that actually he'd been writing as far back as that. And uh, in, Drum actually was not even the first award that he won. He won the Zong Award in, in, in 1949. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, but furthermore, I, I think to round it up, uh, it's about his legacy that much as we're celebrating him, Teddy Moore as, 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 a, as a writer and a, and a journalist, Ken Temba was, was a teacher at heart. You know, um, even though he quit teaching in 1953 uh, to join DRAM after winning that award, he, he remained a teacher. He, he, he taught in the newsroom. Um, I, I spoke to a number of people, including um, uh, Juby Mayet, uh, uh, the likes of Andade Joe Tholoi, uh, who actually he's the one who came up with the, with the phrase, a teacher in the newsroom. He says in Ken Temba, he had a teacher in the newsroom uh, because he, Ken Temba, you know, while Dada Jodlole was trying to get a breakthrough in, the, in journalism, mm -hmm. his pieces get, getting turned away. It was Ken Temba who sat him down, took him through his own script to say, this is where you got it wrong. This is, you know, what you should not do. And this is what you should do. And for the very first time, that George Ole got published in Golden, uh, 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 um, what is it called? Uh, that newspaper, Golden City Post. Okay. And, uh, and that's how his career started in journalism. And he, he counts many. I mean, Ken Temba continued teaching even in his own House of Truth, for instance, because it was all about um, intellectual engagement. So teaching was paramount team? in his life. Oh, absolutely. And of course, the House of Truth is the house he had in Sophia Town where he had gatherings and there was intellectual thought and whatever. And this is what I absolutely love about the, the biography is that you explore in such detail, you know, um, the many facets of Ken Temba, the teacher, the mentor, you know, the writer, of course, looms large, you know, um, the whole drum decades, you know, you do it so well. And that's why in one of the, your launches in Johannesburg, you know, I asked you the question, how difficult was it to write about somebody that you never met, you know, you've essentially met him through other people, but the way you've done it, a person, you know, gets to feel as though you, you, you know, can temper. Now, I want to put you on the spot here uh, and ask you, which was your most difficult interview to do in trying to piece together the life of Ken Temba? Um, perhaps, uh, Nadine Godimas could have been difficult um, because I feel like I'm <laughs> in the really middle of the answer. Yeah, <laughs> in the middle of the interview, I realized that she was actually now talking about Ned Nagasa because she she was a bit old when I had uh, oh. you know I had the interview with her, so one had to. We always are let, um, you know, and, and uh, also compare effects. Because, you know, when we started the interview, she was fine because, you know, she was talking about Ken Temba. In fact, when I got to her house, she even had a copy of Ken Temba's uh, The Will to Die. Wow. You know? But somehow during the conversation, 
she had uh, ventured into another uh, a, a drum writer altogether. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, but it, it was a good thing that um, I was alert and uh, I was able to gently give her a nudge back to Kentemba. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible, you know, and those are some of the challenges of biography writing. You know, as you know, your biography has um, inspired my biography, which I'm working on, on Dolila Tebe, you know. Um, and it's such a balancing act. It's one of the hardest things I've had to do. And that's why I'm in such awe of what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, you, there is also the temptation to write a hagiography because this is someone you idolize that you're writing about. And then, you know, so I think as a biographer, you must try by all means to uh, stick to the facts and and see how you unpack them and link them with other other factors, other aspects of of the person's life. Um, but also, I might mention um, one other interview that I had um, with Malcolm Hart. Yeah. Um, it was a bit awkward to approach him because Malcolm Hart yeah. was the husband of Jean, uh, Jean Hart, yeah. a lady who. Um, while married to Malcolm Hart, fell in love with Ken Temba and ended up moving out of their apartment to, to stay with Ken Temba. So now, I mean, to approach this person uh, and ask him, you know, about how he discovered that his wife had, a, had an affair with my icon, uh, it was a bit awkward, but uh, he made things very easy for me, I must say. It was awkward reading that part. <laughs> 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 um, but you know, Doc, I mean, you know, previously in our conversations, I have actually accused you of romanticizing Ken Temba in this biography, you know, because of <laughs> what other people have written about uh, Ken Temba. But uh, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I think you have done an incredible job, you know, and I want to put you on the spot again, uh, because I think um, we are about to wrap up our interview and ask you to please read your favorite uh, part in the book? You know, what is your favorite part in the book? Um, oh my, why, why didn't you warn me? <laughs> well, this is going to be edited. So, uh, you know, we might actually just start with you reading. Um, uh, any part that you choose. Oh, I thought you were choosing for me. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. Um, Only one person so, ever made me read from the book. And is this me? What is yeah. the part that you read at the, at the State Theatre Lodge? I can't even remember where it was. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it was the part on Sophia. Oh, okay. See. Why do you always do this you to might. me? Ah, please, you know, you know that I will, uh, you know, if, well, if things are easy, I will make them difficult, you know, that, <laughs> that you, you can trust. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read from page 42. The chapter is called From Marabasta to Sofia Town and Beyond. It begins with an um, ep epigraph from uh, Louis Morsi, where he says, for Ken Temba, the African township represented the strength and the will to survive by ordinary masses of the African people. In its own way, the township represented a dogged defiance against official persecution. For in the township, the moments of splendor were sp very splendid indeed, surpassing anything White Johannesburg could offer." End quote. After completing his studies at Fort Hill, Ken Temba moved back to the Transvaal in 1949 where he settled in Sofia Town, a freehold township outside Johannesburg. He was soon to become one of its most iconic figures. Today, he stands out as one of the most prominent chroniclers of Sofia Town of the 1950s. This is evident both in his fiction and in his journalistic pieces, in which Sofia Town is the dominant setting. He writes with great conviction about his personalities, its tribunes, the poetry and politics of the place, some of the key historic moments, and finally, its destruction. So Fire Town is where he came of age as a writer and journalist, earning himself yet another moniker, the sage of Sophia Town. Temba wrote about the cracks and 
pennies of Sofa Town with, cinema, with cinematic vividness, great passion, and unparalleled erudition, demonstrating intimate connection with the area. In the beat of drum, his reflections on the, of the period, Jim Bailey writes that Temba's understanding of the Black townships of Johannesburg was intuitive, complete, and magical. In his own Requiem for Sofa Town, Temba describes life in the area as swarming, cacophonous, strutting, brawling, and vibrating. Stories like he is must celebrate the suit, the will to die, and bottom of the bottle, all explore the anxieties of the ecstasies, the crudities and crevices of everyday life in Sofa Town. Oh, brilliant, Doc. Thank you so, so much for that reading. And once again, you know, congratulations on writing this wonderful biography about the sage of Sophia Town. So thank you for your time. I'm sure, um, you know, we will not be, uh, this will not be the last time we come knocking on your door, uh, you know, for other, other projects. But thank you very much, Doc. Uh, thank you. Your- thank you so much. Yara Nakahanda Montera, welcome to uh, Conversations with African Writers, uh, and I'm delighted uh, to have you in the show. Uh, a little bit about you, uh, Yara Nakahanda Montero was born in Angola in 1979 and moved to Portugal when she was two years old, right? Her first novel, Essa Dama Batebue, translated into English as Loose Ties, was written and published in uh, 2018. It is an electrifying and colorful story with shadows of an uncertain and shifting past. It is both a story of love and war, a contemporary tale that deals with the past, a call for the independence of women as political beings and of their own bodies in search of freedom. Yara's novel is already translated into several languages. Yara's first poetry book can be classified as decolonial and eco-feminist poetry titled Memories, Apparitions, Arrhythmias, and it is published by Penguin Random House. Yara studied screenwriting and contemporary art. She has collaborated in the creation of scripts and screenplays for audiovisual arts and is a curator for podcast programming. Her stories and poetry have been published in various magazines, such as Granta and Revista Pessoa. She is a regular guest speaker at universities on topics like feminism and Afro-European identities and narratives. Yara Nakahanda Montero, again, welcome. And I look forward to our conversation today. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you for having me here. It is with great pleasure, I have to say. This is uh, my first uh, talk with the South African uh, University. I've been in South Africa a few times, and it's also a country very close to my heart, uh, especially if we talk about Nelson Mandela and all the great job that he did for everyone, not only in uh, South Africa, but for the African and worldwide black community. So thank you very much for having me here. Well, we are uh, delighted yeah, to have you. We are absolutely <laughs> delighted as uh, the University of Pretoria and as the Future Africa Institute. Uh, Yara, now as um, uh, uh, we discussed that you are going to read um, the first chapter of your uh, fantastic uh, historical novel, which we are discussing today, uh, Loose Ties, um, before we launch into our discussion. So um, I look forward to your reading, heading over to you. Okay, so let's go. Mm -hmm. A very first memory, it's a tree. The second, a wave. Without casting a shadow, she flies through the roots, bearing the bottom of the sea. She doesn't exist prior to that moment or beyond it. These are images that burst into her dreams and terrifies her sleep. From time to time, whiffs of the intense aroma of sour milk emerges. Then the taste of sweet, salty, 
that lingers on her tongue. Part of her finds comforts in, this, in such sensations. The other part is disturbed by the emptiness they bring. These are the only the memories she had left of her mother. The most intimate true is so not to be able to claim her mother as hers. She knows that. Rosa Chitula, her mother, loved Angola more than she loved her daughter and fought for the country. Her name is Vitoria Queiroz da Fonseca. She's a woman. She's black. Beautiful. Absolutely. Sorry for my English. English is not my first language or second language. <laughs> Beautifully read, beautifully read. And you know, um, what comes across so strongly um, when you read the, the, that first uh, chapter mm. is really, I think that the rhythm of the original, because it was originally published in Portuguese, right? Um, exactly. And translated um, uh, by Sandra Tamale into English mm. as uh, a Loose Tiles. And really it is the story of uh, Victoria, who uh, is uh, in search of her mother, who was a guerrilla in the war in Angola, right? Um, so talk to us about, you know, why this really uh, um, such captivating story about, you know, um, such a, a, a powerful, I think, uh, emotions, you know, um, the motherhood uh, and, and country, you know, um, the search for a mother and the search of place, you know. Um, and I, I was intrigued. So the first question is really more about me as well as a writer. Why, why the story? The story uh, arose as a, a need on my individual path as a woman, an African woman and a black woman, really. When I wrote it, it's interesting, when I wrote it, I didn't really thought about, I want to write a, a, the colonial feminine book or I want to I wanna write a book that portrays uh, the struggle of women. No, I wanted to write a book with, to understand the country where I born, to understand this 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 uh, this uh, path that my family had to do to run away from the war and move to Portugal and all the heritage that I still carry from the Portugal uh, uh, colonial history. So it was really about it was really about it was really a selfish I would say a selfish um, reason that I decided to write and on my pursuit of trying to understand who I am where I come from. I start reading about the, country, the story of my country. And I need to, to clarify that because I was, I, I was raised and I, st I did my education in Portugal, uh, in the Portug Portuguese uh, uh, school books, Africa basically just starts with the arrival of uh, the European white man. So uh, I didn't have any or very little understanding of all the culture, um, all the heritage of, of my, 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 own, my, my own country. So that's when I start digging also in my family archive, my grandfather, he, 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 during the years, he, he built an archive, that, uh, a personal archive and also an historical archive. And through that, um, I said, Okay, there's something lacking here. I couldn't hear the voices of women. Mm -hmm. And by coincidence, because I could, uh, I believe also on this type of coincidence, I came, I came across a, a book that really portrays the contribution of, uh, of, uh, of Angola uh, women for, uh, for the liberation and also during the civil war. And then I said, Okay, I want to write about it. I want to write about uh, all the struggle that we go through uh, as women and as Black women. I want to write about maternity as well. I want to write about the story of, of uh, uh, I want to write about the, the story of the women of my family, their struggle, how they've been up, uh, up uh, the patriarchal system was imposed to them, how they always lived a little bit more for the men rather than from their, to their really 
the dreams. So, and if you pick up the first um, the first st statement of this book, her first memory is a tree, the second a wave. So the first memory of Victoria, yes, it's the tree. But me as an author, my first memory is the wave. And I also wanted to, to bring, uh, to cross both paths uh, on this history, on, on, uh, on uh, creating the narrative. It was something that I, I, I did with intention. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, I mean, I, I think you've explained it so beautifully um, because my next question was to be um, that you very um, deliberately uh, Victoria goes in search of her mother, you know, um, she doesn't go in search of her father, who she also doesn't know, you know, she was uh, raised by her aunt and her grandparents in Portugal, you know, um, but she goes in search of, you know, the mother, you know, um, mm. I think also uh, talk to us a bit about that, because you seem in the book, I mean, one of the, the, the big themes in the book is about place and belonging, right? Um, uh, who you are in the world, you know? Um, and symbolically, the mother seems to mean a lot around who we are, you know? Um, and, you know, why not the mother and the father? Why have you uh, um, very specifically tied issues of belonging to the mother? Uh, I don't know how it is in South Africa, but at least in Angola, uh, yeah. there's even a saying that says, we always know who is the mother, but who is the father? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just also a joke, but it, yes. there's some, there's some yeah. meaning. There's some meaning on this uh, because uh, mm. the, the majority of the African cultures, the matriarch, matriarchal, matriarchal, yes, yes, yes. The, it is the matriarchal thing. cultures, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, when uh, you can almost relate the omph of the mother mm -hmm. to a country, mm -hmm. to the beginning, mm -hmm. to the beginning of the times, and also it was intention that mm -hmm. she almost ignore. In, in my book, I very little uh, Victoria uh, talks about her father yeah. or wants to know her father. That was also intentional because, again. It was, it, this is a, a feminist book. This is a book about women, about the power of women, about our ancestral um, systems of power that were removed from all the African uh, women. That's why it's the mother. And again, I wanted to portray uh, a, a mother, a strong mother, a godness mother almost, in the sense that someone that could rule. Yes, and uh, it, it's intriguing also that, I mean, um, as Victoria uh, goes in search of the mother, right, um, there are um, a few women uh, that she comes across uh, mm -hmm. who are almost like a, a North Star for her a in North this star. search uh, for the mother, right? Um, and one of the most intriguing uh, 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 character um, is, 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 is uh, Romana. Romana, who she stays with yeah. when she first, you know, um, arrives in, in Luanda, you know. Um, and of course, you know, Ro Ro she does not belong to, to any man. Uh, she and her twin daughters, right? Um, so uh, talk to us also about uh, the character of Romana, who you describe as, you know, she's, she's bossy, she's caring, she's pampering, you know? Uh, and she, she is really this large uh, uh, figure uh, in terms of a big yeah. describe uh, of, of the, the matriarchal uh, uh, cultures. So talk to us about Romena, you know, what has um, uh, um, uh, just uh, um, uh, inspired, you know, a character like Romena? Romena is really inspired on, uh, on the women that, are, uh, that really also surround me, the African women, and especially when I was in Angola. Mm -hmm. I came across uh, a, a lot of uh, single parent uh, families mm -hmm. as well, where, where was the mother again, yeah. was the figure. So, and this, and this is like this um, community 
that we they don't have uh, the official power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they don't have the political titles or uh, the government titles but these these women they really rule the city the families yeah. the, the the domestic side they cannot go further because there's the ceiling of the patriarchal system really but yes they demonstrate in their in their area of action all the leadership skills so i saw this uh, i i saw this constantly and if you notice also in in, in the book you mentioned uh, Romena, um yeah. but there's all others there the majority of the the women they're all strong women that on their space of action they strong leaders and they know how to navigate the system to survive yeah and and what is interesting i mean you rightly point out that yes there is there's a romena there are her daughters you know and of course um uh, there is um uh, juliana who is a, 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 a yeah. very yeah, important character but what is in, intriguing as well is in how you have written these uh, women who are um, um leading in the private sphere but uh, also uh, juliana who fought in the war right um yeah. but what is intriguing about your novel is that you don't paper over even some of the um, uh, contradictions uh, in relationships mm. between between the women because there is yes there is romena but there is also uh, josepha and, and mariella you know who are inhabiting uh, a different space to 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 romena yes you know? yes um, and in a sense you know romena advises uh, vittoria to say look don't think about the contradictions if you want to survive in the space mm. you know um if you want to survive the post colonial landscape don't think about the slippages just keep it moving you know um so talk to us also about that relationship to say yes women can be supportive but not necessarily no and no no exactly because we need we also need to cross something very important that is um, um class elite yeah the social the social hierarchy and this was something that uh, it, it is very visible in any society yeah and i saw it's very common uh, that for instance in europe uh, um white feminists they go they go protest but then someone mm -hmm. are is cleaning uh, the house and stay with their kids and if we start digging how much how much are they paying yeah what are really doing for the women that you every day look in their eyes yeah so mm -hmm. i also want i also wanted exactly to translate this contradiction and how um, race and class yeah uh, sometimes they they don't overlap on um, on um, on people's personal uh, goals and another thing that it's critical on my book and sometimes the, the, i think it's important especially to to explain to south africans uh, students and people because you have the upper type but in angola in angola uh, at the beginning of the century it mm -hmm. was shocking to see the the colonial heritage yeah, yeah. and yes it, uh, what you mentioned about rumena and the uh housekeepers and mm -hmm. also another situations that we have to, in the book uh colorism was is there was there yeah and there was and 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 it 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 it, it, it was a way of discrimination it was a way of uh, racism of lacking of access but it was also again as i said it's something that was inherited from colonialism and stayed in the in the in the unconscious of the of society and rumena like you and like me we also contradict ourselves so i i also try to put i try i i, I try to put it um, for me a good a, a good fiction character uh, needs to have contradictions yeah we're not here to mellow to mellow stories we need to show them how they are and people are and people are not perfect yeah yeah like Romana. and i mean the the book um wow just that um the contradiction between you know the love and yearning for 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 country uh, but in uh, 
I think it's in chapter six, um, when Victoria does arrive in Angola, you know, um, there is the, 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 you know, emotional pull, there is the yearning, uh, but also I think the shock, um, you know, which is symbolized by it, it's pouring, you know, the, the, the pouring rain, um, the shock of the reality, you know, um, uh, but, the, the, you know, the, um, the love is always there, you know. Um, but mm. talk to us a bit about, um, obviously, you, you, you felt it important to center women in history and to honor women's uh, involvement um, in, in, in the colonial struggle, uh, you know, uh, and mm. in the, uh, the fight for freedom, right? You felt it important. Mm. Um, what for you, I mean, I think for our generation, for future generations, I mean, what is the importance of that? I mean, what, what does history uh, 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 do? What is the importance of historical narratives and women in those historical narratives? I mean, why the, 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 the urgency, why the emotion that one uh, 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 reads in Loose Ties? I think first it's, I think the, the main, uh, for me, I think the main thing it's because it brings a different perspective. It brings visibility. Mm -hmm. A lot of readers came to me and said, oh, I didn't know that women had a role, really that they were holding guns, yeah, yeah. Uh, and fighting for, for this utopic uh, political uh, uh, ambitions. Uh, most of so we give we 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 bring a new perspective. So this it is fiction. It's interesting, but it triggered in the reader in the readers a will to go and investigate. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. learn more about this side of this, uh, of history. I want to know this narrative. That's the first thing I think visibility. The second thing it's about it shows how resilient. We are as women. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's good that we are too resilient and we just don't explode sometimes. But we mm. it shows our undercover um, struggles as well, mm. I think. Mm. And the, for me, there's a, 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 a scene in the book that it's very important. It's as you say, what what are we leaving to the next generations? In the book, the grand uh, the grandmother of the Victoria's uh, uh, grandmother, she realized she cannot do anything else with her life. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's this scene with with the the bride dress, yeah. but she realized she can give her grand granddaughter a better a better future. So mm -hmm. she breaks the shame of of of, of um, the shame. Uh, with a with a granddaughter by telling go, go and find your way. So I think yeah. that's also the, the 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 power of fiction and also to show these contradictions. I saw a lot of these contradictions mm -hmm. in my own family. I saw uh, people there that are uh, uh, pro independence, people that mm -hmm. were not pro independence. Yeah, yeah. of uh, Angola. Yeah. So it also demonstrates that we all have a, a version mm. of the history and what is the real version we, we, we don't know. So what is important to, to, for the future uh, generation is that we'll always look for all versions and find your own one as well. There's not, it, normally it's interesting, the one yeah. that is in the official books <laughs> yeah. for yes. shows that <laughs> For sure, there's another one. So go ahead yes. for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, as your, the title of your book says, you know, all these these loose ties, you know. Yes. Um, and what is I think powerful about the book is that um, it really um, uh, uh, depicts the the, the emotion uh, of 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 um, you know all of our. Um, all of our journeys, right? Um, even just the start of Victoria's uh, journey, her running away from what was her grandmother's destiny, that you have to have a decent marriage, you know? Um, and of course she is in, a, um, in love with a woman and, you know, she mm -hmm. runs and, 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 you know, and leaves and then uh, um, uh, goes on the search, uh, um, you know, um, for her mother. Um, talk to us about um, uh, uh, the general, 
uh, who loves the general, General uh, Zakaria. Ah, general. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I think, you know, interestingly, again... Everyone you know, loves how, the general. Oh, my word, the general is a lot, eh? The, 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 the poetry-loving general, you know? So you know, the general, you know, he is a, a hero or a villain, you know, uh, yeah, depending yeah. On, 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 on which side, uh, which way you look at it, you know. Uh, but I was intrigued, uh, you know, that um, obviously you have to do your, your, your research, you know. I mean, he is a large character, you know. Uh, and I was fascinated, I mean, do you know uh, somebody like the general? I mean, how do you research and write? somebody like the general, you know, who is oh, yeah. symbolic of so many of our vices. <laughs> yeah. No, mm. the, the, the general, it's, it's a character that it's a little bit, it's typical. It was typical. Yeah. On the post-war in Luanda, of course, you had these generals that were fighting in the war and then they, uh, they become uh, businessmen and they become also very well respected among the uh, among society. And mm -hmm. you know how it is also in uh, at least in Angola culture. In Angola cultures, if there's uh, it's like the the big father or the soba we call the soba the the leader mm -hmm. of the village. It's someone that you always go for help if you need money. So it's someone that also mm -hmm. is very respectful. Mm -hmm. Someone that there's really a community spirit. Okay, yeah. and the general yeah. is really that figure. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I also wanted to 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 make the readers to understand, and it's also written on my book, war mm -hmm. makers monsters. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what we become as people during the war is really our what really what we are. So that's why the general is. I, I wanted to create really this contradiction of someone that was mean, that was a rape, uh, a raper, a yeah. raper in, in war. But mm. you really cannot hate him now. No, As he, no, yeah. he's uh, he's funny. He likes yeah. poetry. He treats. He's, uh, he's one of us. You know, he's so one of not exactly the, the monster out there. He is the monster in here. Um, it's, it's, yeah, we are monsters. That's a very, that's a very, thank you for that. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. We are also monsters in the sense it just depends. We monsters and angels. It just depends. We are feeding the most. And this is not, this is one uh, very, yeah. very well-known quote. So the yeah. war, in war, it's a survival, it's fighting. We're just feeding mm. the monsters in ourselves. So we become monsters. Juliana, she was not very nice. To, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, I mean, the Victoria's mother. Yes. Re resolution of that whole uh, story, you know. Uh, but on the one hand, as well, I mean, she she herself is is a kind of mentor to uh, to Victoria, you know. Uh, she has that side of her, you know. And she's saving uh, a lot um, of lives now. She's saving yeah. lives, a lot yeah. of lives. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, you know, it's uh, uh, you know that contradiction, and I think it's interesting. Um, what the book uh, explores, uh, because for us as African countries, I think that, um, I mean, I was reading it from a, a South African point of view, you know, about um, just what war does to you and the fact that we have not really begun, I think, to tell that story uh, sufficiently, you know, I don't think, um, because a lot of us, you know, uh, you are just in the state where you continue, you know, you, you get on with the business of, of, of living and, and you don't really uh, want to excavate uh, a, a oh, no. story, yeah. you know? Um, and I think perhaps uh, historical narratives are a useful buffer for that trauma, you know, uh, so that we can then work through, um, you know, all, all of our histories. And I was wondering uh, as well, because, you know, when I finished reading the book, I was like, oh, no, I, I don't want you to finish, you know, uh, the story of, of, of Victoria, you know, is there a sequel, you know? Uh, <laughs> I hope so. You know, I will what, work what, on what that, happens, yes. you know? How, how does she get rerouted into Angola? You know, is her yearning uh, satisfied? You know, I, I just felt like I wanted to hear more you know, about yeah. the stories of, 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 of women in Angola. Is, is there a sequel? I hope so. I think that's also one of... 
it's a not sure if I'm gonna give a spoil, uh, but it's like it's an open it's an open end. It's something that can be worked on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned. Let's go back to what you said. Going back to traumas and to our pasts, it's quite hard. Yeah. yeah. I lived in Angola. I, I was raised. I was born in Angola, but I had no memories of Angola. I just returned when I was a a, a young woman. It yeah. took me after I leave Angola. Uh, it mm -hmm. took me more than 10 years to start mm -hmm. writing this book, to have mm -hmm. conversations with my uh, grandmother, grandmother uh, with my mother. And for mm -hmm. them, it was painful. I mm -hmm. even discovered, I even discovered things from my own history that I didn't knew. Like my, my great, great grandmother, she was enslaved. So mm -hmm. as you said, it, it is doing writing historical fiction brings mm -hmm. a lot of new things not only for the reader but i think also for uh, for the writer that mm -hmm. that can be can be very difficult yeah. uh, I, I plan i plan to to maybe to keep on writing exactly on, on this theme going back to your question vittoria the point on this book is, is not about if vittoria got rooted the point of this book is not about answers. Mm -hmm. It's about the questions. Yeah. This book yeah. is about questions. It's not about a single truth. Yeah. It's about several. That's why Juliana turn, turns to Vittoria and say, what yeah. truth do you want? Your yeah. truth, my, my. Yeah, it's I can a, give you, I can package it anyway. I can, yeah. I can package, because that's what you say when, uh, who writes history? Mm. Yeah, you, and the, the same you uh, in Angola, special uh, it was it was decades of war. First Independence yeah. War, then yeah. the, civ the, the, civ the civil, civil war. war. Yeah. It's uh, I think I think what was important, at least for me, it was more I need to make questions, and yeah. uh, and only after the questions I can find my own answers. But there's so many questions to, still to be done. Yeah, and that's what was so liberating about your book. Um, you know, as I said, that even for for myself, uh, having lived through apartheid, you know, having lived through the war, that sometimes somebody else's story of war helps you think through your story. You know, um, and uh, reading uh, about the lives of the characters um, helps uh, gives you focus. You know, you are, we are almost able to see the South African uh, uh, story and the uh, South African uh, miracle uh, clearer, you know, uh, when you read the contradictions of, of Luanda, when you read about the Gulf um, between rich and poor, you know, um, when you read about the, the, the role of the women and how their experience of war uh, was, was different you know, yeah. uh, was different and what they suffered was often uh, 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 those stories that are untold, you know. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for writing this book. I mean, I think it's a very important book. I think it's oh, a yeah, very, right. you know, um, and just looking uh, into the, 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 the micro stories and looking into the personal, I thought, you know, was very, very powerful. And I was also interested, you know, because obviously, I mean, I love historical uh, fiction. I love biography, absolutely adore it, you know. Um, and uh, so who are the other, other you know, uh, uh, works of historical fiction uh, that inspire you as a writer? You know, um, who, who, who do you read uh, that you uh, feel, you know, uh, uh, from a historical writing point of view, you know, is an inspiration uh, uh, to, to Yara? Hmm. I, I may say that when I, when, as I said, when I wrote this book, it, I was not yeah. like, I'm going to write a historical book. In fact, I, I find it as a, a great compliment from you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that. I think uh, there's plenty Angolan ones, especially for instance, uh, Pepe Tella. Uh, yes. Because normally, yes. I, also, I also say, I, 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 mm -hmm. I'm just building my path on mm -hmm. some ones that already open. Um, uh, um, Paula, uh, Pauline uh, Shiziana, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the Mozambican one, also for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm also reading much more now about uh, African historical uh, mm -hmm. books. Maza, 
You may know yes, Basim and Chelsea. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's in the story. Yeah. So um, and and yes, and I think also what we cannot what we cannot forget it's the 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 gatekeepers, the real gatekeepers also of historical facts are elder people. So talk with them. Mm, mm. Talk with them. That's what I did. My grand, I learned much. I learned more by talking with my uh, grandmother rather than almost reading uh, historical books because she gives the perspective of the common citizen, the common person, the common woman. Mm. And sometimes that uh, it's not in in a, in, in the in a, in non-fiction books as well. Mm. But yes, we cannot. If there's a, the biggest learning I have to say about writing this uh, book, mm -hmm. it was to value elder people, what they know. My second, I can tell you, my second uh, book, the poetry book, again, mm -hmm. it's yeah. almost, it was, it was almost uh, written, uh, taking inspirations from the stories told my, by my, my grandmother. Oh, so talk, talk, talk with the elders, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that is the, the history that is not acknowledged. You know, you won't find it, like you say, you won't find it in the history books. Oh, no, um, of course, no, no, no. But it is a valid and powerful book. And I love that also you, you acknowledge your, your, your grandmother, you acknowledge your great, My great family, grandmother, yeah. uh, who you were named, named after. Yeah, Nakahanda. Naka, yeah. Nakahanda. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much, you know, for thank your you for, for your reflections. Thank you for your book. Um, and thank you for for, for this chat. Um, no, and thank and, you for having me here. Yeah. No, it was absolutely brilliant. And will you be visiting uh, South Africa anytime soon? So we can no, uh, no I have to I need to I need to to go back for sure. I was there three years ago. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, it was it was very i like i like south africa a lot uh so but yes. let's see it's quite far away now next time that i go to it's angola when it's, i go to angola i go to first i need to go to angola and then go to to south africa this uh, covid situation really messed up our life so no, i was it supposed really, to be back really, uh, uh, been... yeah but and i hope you do come here Yes, sir. No, I, will, I hope, in fact, you know, Angola is, is the country of my, my imagination, obviously, because, you know, through the stories of freedom, we've heard so much about Angola, you know, uh, and also the alliances, you know, during the wars and so yeah. on. But it is one country on the continent I have not visited. You know? We need to solve so, that. We're going to solve I that. Need to solve it. I need to solve it. You know, um, my family members yeah. have been in Angola, you know, uh, some of them were in exile in Angola, you know. Mm. Um, so I, I've heard about Angola from their perspective, you know, um, and of course I love Angolan music, you know, uh, so it's through the, the, the literature and the music that I've experienced uh, uh, Luanda, you know, but it is one country that is on my right. to-do list, you know, so maybe I will come, to, uh, we will meet in Angola. <laughs> when you go really there, nice, yes. Set, <laughs> we must set up, Fantastic. but uh, wonderful talking to you and I really do hope we meet in person soon. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your beautiful, beautiful novel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers, Yara. <laughs> <laughs>